so um, I'm going to stand up. I've been on a red eye on my way over here, and if I keep sitting, I may never stand up again. Um, this has the added benefit of my being able to see past the second row. Uh, I am uh, tall for people from India. And, um, you know, um, they say I'm short, but a good organizer actually has to have their feet to the ground. So I'm going to stand up, and I'm going to tell you a little bit about something extraordinary that happened in Hershey, Pennsylvania last year. Um, that gives us a little glimpse about something extraordinary that's happening in America and around the world. Um, I'm going to talk about how groups of workers um, who are, in a sense, um, the deepest down on the subcontracting chain, um, the most temporary, the most precarious, um, actually offer us the imagination um, to organize beyond what we perhaps think is possible. So last year in August in Hershey, Pennsylvania, uh, something extraordinary happened. A group of 400 workers decided to occupy the plant floor of Hershey's biggest chocolate factory uh, in that region, uh, the logistics plant, the Eastern Distribution Center um, near Harrisburg, Pennsylvania. Um, this was in August, about a month before Occupy was uh, a well-known term uh, in the United States, um, actually about exactly a month before Occupy. Um, and what was even more extraordinary was who these workers were. These were 400 young people from around the world, from China, from Moldova, from Turkey, um, and from about 10 other countries. These were all college students from college campuses who had been recruited to be part of a cultural exchange program. Um, these were uh, recruiters who had gone to their campuses, sold them dreams and a bill of goods. Uh, they paid all the way out in China and Mongolia, um, upwards of 2000 sometimes as much as $5,000, for a chance to come and experience American culture. It turned out that they came to work for the Hershey Chocolate Corporation where they worked 12-hour shifts, some in the day, some at night, to package chocolates. They were um, sleeping and living in company property. They weren't allowed to take breaks. Um, and their take-home pay was about $1 to $5 an hour. So they were told they would experience American culture, and they did. Um, they came and became captive workers for the 1%. And when we found them in Hershey, Pennsylvania, um, they wanted to organize. So after, so six weeks after the first door knock, we organized a plant occupation. 400 workers uh, tried to burst into uh, the company property. And outside, uh, the uh, Pennsylvania State Federation President, Rick Bloomingdale, uh, members of the AFL-CIO affiliates um, in, in Pennsylvania, uh, SCIU and other parts of the labor movement, uh, participated in civil disobedience. The gates of the company uh, were locked, so we had half of our students locked inside the logistics factory and half outside. Outside, while the civil disobedience uh, was being conducted, um, the students inside sat down, and on that plant floor, uh, they conducted a historic plant occupation. Um, and while they did it, they sang a song called Ciao Bella, uh, which the Turkish students learned uh, in Turkey during the democratic movement um, and were now teaching the Chinese and other students. It was a euphoric moment indeed, and I remember coming out from uh, the, uh, you know, the, the, the plant occupation, and I remember going back uh, to the uh, union hall of uh, the Baker's Union, BCTGM. That local in Hershey was actually started many years ago in 1937, in the midst of another plant occupation, a sit-down strike. And I spoke to a student who I didn't recognize as Turkish. Um, he didn't look Turkish to me, so I asked him his name. His name was Muhammad. I asked him um, where he was from. He said he actually was from Egypt. He had gone from Cairo to be an exchange student in Turkey. Um, and from Turkey, he had accepted the recruitment letter and come to Hershey's. He said that he had been on Tahrir Square and he was caught up in the euphoria, and this reminded him of that euphoria. It was an incredible moment, uh, you know, a moment where hope and history looked like the same thing. 
And reflecting on it, I think that it's particularly important because the Hershey story really tells the story of an economy. It tells the story of an economy that has come to depend on, number one, the transformation of permanent work into temporary work in this country. And secondly, the story of an economy that has depended on the suppression of the right to organize and attacks on the right to collectively bargain. The Hershey factory um, simply lifted the lid off of the labor market and the economy that the 1% want. Um, Hershey's business model over the last years was to take jobs that were local jobs, union jobs, they came with rights, respect, and a contract, and a living wage. Um, over 10 years, Hershey's sent some of its jobs to Mexico, um, and then started to import workers from all over the world into its biggest logistics factory. Um, along the way, what happened was that DHL, the large global logistics uh, company, uh, had its um, its uh, subsidiary in the United States, Excel, come to Hershey. And so the, there was a, a, a subcontracting chain. Um, these, Hershey was, you know, the manufacturer. Um, Hershey's logistics were being run by Excel. Excel hired a temporary labor agency called SHS. SHS then contracted with a labor recruiter. And that labor recruiter was the principal employer of the workers who we organized. And the labor recruiter wasn't even an employer. Um, the recruiters uh, turned the workers into participants in a cultural exchange program. So these students had no rights. Um, they didn't have the right to bargain. Um, it didn't function within an NLRA bargaining framework. Yet, six weeks after the first uh, door knock, they, they staged a plant occupation. And um, the incident leapt from uh, Hershey, Pennsylvania, to the pages of the New York Times, which reported on the campaign eight times in the following six weeks. And this year, uh, we had two huge victories. Uh, the State Department sanctioned Hershey's recruiter, and um, the Department of Labor uh, fined Hershey's subcontractor to the tune of a uh, quarter of a million dollars. What's interesting about these victories, though, was that in the public imagination, they were victories against Hershey's. <laughs> they were victories against the 1%. They were not lost in the layers of subcontracting. You did not have to convince the American public, oh, but re they really were packing Kit Kats. Everybody was convinced Hershey's was the problem. And I think it's a, it's a lesson in the fact that although it's difficult to organize temporary and subcontracted workers, um, it also offers extraordinary opportunities for community labor partnerships because labor has an interest in it and so does the community. And it also offers the ability to have mini victories in all those mini fights and macro, micro fights that can add a lot of fuel to the overall corporate battle that we're waging. <coughs> the story of guest workers doesn't stop in Hershey, Pennsylvania. Next week, many of us are going to be landing on Bank of America. Um, Bank of America, for example, uses guest workers through what they call body shops, large numbers of um, US and Indian um, high-tech temp agencies that bring Indian workers from India, but pay them as if they're still living in India in rupees, and then supply them to companies like Bank of America and, um, uh, and GE.